So my academic background is physics and astronomy. Um, I moved into data science about um, eight or nine years ago. Um, I've, I've worked as a data science practitioner and then as of about three years ago, I transitioned to working as a like a data science tool builder. So I work now at um, Posit, formerly our studio, um, where I work on open source, um, uh, open source software for modeling, machine learning, and now um, ML ops for, for Python and R. And um, one of the things that I think is a theme through my um, career, like a like a kind of connecting idea, is that I'm very interested in people's um, practical workflows in how people do their real work, what makes it hard. I'm thinking about systems, like how do people use systems to get their work done? And that's been, you know, whether I've been working as a data science practitioner in an organization, um, working on, you know, text analysis tools, um, or, or more recently as I've been focusing on machine learning tools. So, so given that, when I saw this tweet, which has been in a bunch of talks already, um, well, when this when this tweet that from from Vicky uh, had this phrase in it, how many K folds is too many? I saw this, and my immediate reaction was, oh, but I actually want to give a talk about that. <laughs> like, I actually want to talk to people about that because. Um, the one of the tools that I think we don't hear enough about that we um, that can be super helpful in many situations is um, the tool to answer this kind of question. And it's in my title. It's not a spoiler to say like that tool is um, simulations, building simulations. I feel like in data work, you know, we don't we don't see blog posts about it. You don't hear about it as a tool to use. And and honestly, what is more? normy what is more norm conf than just like doing the same thing thousands of times and you know like i just have to do the same thing over and over to figure to figure something out um so i specifically want to talk about how simulation is a powerful tool oh, like why why is it powerful it's powerful because it helps us make our assumptions concrete um, assumptions I have in my brain, assumptions that my collaborators have in their brains. How can we make it concrete? How can we get on the same page with people that we're working with about trade-offs? You know, some of us may be thinking, oh, it's, it will be better if we do it like this. It will be better if we do it like this. Often there are trade-offs between those decisions and simulations help us um, understand what they are and get on the same page with each other. And ultimately simulation helps us like make better decisions by, um, by be through these kind of very things. So let, um, so I um, uh, have one of the big projects I have been working on in recent years is um, called Tidy Models. So Tidy Models is a, um, a framework in R for modeling and machine learning using Tidyverse principles. I'm going to show you some, there is going to be like code on the screen here and it's going to be mostly Tidy Models code. Um, so I'm excited for you get to see it, but really this, like, this is not a talk about tidy models or because what we're talking about more is how to use simulation and I think the hopefully the way we talk through some of these ideas you know even if you use a different you know usually use a different framework for machine learning or your data work or you know like different you know whatever language or framework you like to use hopefully this will be um, applicable here so let's jump in. Let's jump into this question. This first question, how many folds is too many? This is a question about predictive modeling, supervised machine learning, kind of the sort of like classical, I have inputs, I want to predict outputs. Um, and, and the purpose of folds, of making cross-validation folds, is to, um, is to estimate the performance of a model, to be able to say how well a model or a model configuration or hyperparameter configuration, how well is it performing. So to do this, we need some data. How are you going to get this data? I'm going to talk through this talk about a couple of different ways that you can approach this, but one way is to use an existing function that is meant for simulations. These are out there. Um, go looking for them um, in the in the frameworks and you know languages that you're comfortable with. Um, here's a function that simulates data for a regression model. It's got you know down here we can see it's got 20 predictors, one outcome. Like the idea is we predict the outcome from these predictors, just like with whatever kind of regression we want to use. We can look up in the docs how the outcomes are related to the um, predictors. And like this is one way you can get started kind of in a straightforward way with simulations, um, especially if the simulation is kind of about a general kind of modeling problem or machine learning kind of practice you want to get to. Look for one of these functions. So once we have that, we can 
you know, since we're interested in how many folds, we can create folds. So as a very brief um, um, memory jog or, or, um, or reminder, um, uh, V-fold cross-validation, or also called K-fold cross-validation, is where you, you take your data. Remember, we had a 1,000, uh, because I said, give me a 1,000. We have a 1,000 observations. Let's divide this into K-folds. The default in tidy models is to use 10 folds. So let's divide it into 10 folds. And then let's create a whole set of resamples where we hold out one of those folds, all the rest of them go together. We train on the nine folds and estimate performance from the 10 that's held out or the 100 that's or the, the 101, the 100 observations, the one fold that's held out. Then we slide it down. Now this one's held out. We train on these nine folds, estimate performance using this one held out fold, and we slide on down here. Um, so, so that was a little reminder of what um, V fold cross or K fold cross validation is. So um, how the default is 10. You'll see 10 as a default a lot. How do I know that's the right number? So let's go through some steps. So how we can find that. So I've made folds. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fit a model to these folds. So I am going to fit a basic random forest using all those predictors. I'm going to fit it to the folds and then I'm going to extract out some metrics. Let's just use some default metrics that are good for regression, RMSE and R squared here. So this is me fitting um, um, one, one model um, to each of the folds 10 times and getting results out that tell me the performance of this model um, with the default of 10. So, but I, I got to do this a bunch of times. I need, I'm going to use simulations to do this. So um, uh, almost always when I'm writing simulations, I start with like the small problem and then build up. So let's start building up and write a function that will let me do this a whole bunch of times. So the, what this function does is first it generates a new simulated data set, um, divides that new simulated data set into cross-validation fold, fits this basic random forest model to it, and then collects the metrics. And so here what you're seeing is that I have said, okay, give me a thousand um, rows of data. Uh, what do I get if I have V equals three? So before I showed you V equals 10, here's V equals three. So what I wanna do though, is I wanna now scale this up and I want to um, be able to test lots of different kinds of values. So here is where I'm going to do that. I'm going to set up um, different values of V. So I'm doing this from 4 to 24, and I'm stepping forward by 2. And I'm going to do my simulation 100 times at each one of these. So on the at the 4 level, I'm doing 4-fold cross-validation 100 times. At the 24th end, I'll do 24-fold um, uh, cross-validation and I'll do that a hundred times and then um, I, I'll take these values I can map across them applying my function and then get out the metrics that I have so here is the part this is the first thing that I'm putting on the screen here that um, actually ran long enough that I might want to like get up and do something else, go check whatever social media is is um, <clears throat> doing these days. And so I want to speak, I put efficient in the title because um, when you think about simulation, um, um, this is not usually something that's going to be deployed in a production environment and these really low latency. We don't need to think about efficiency in that way. What you need to think about efficiency when it comes to simulation is how well can you use the tools that you have to get going Going. And is it is it like I don't think it's important that a simulation is over optimized, but it is able to finish in a time that is useful to you on your analysis time frame. All right, so now that we've got this, let's make a little bit of a visualization to see. So I'm going to focus on RMSE. I could have instead chosen R squared if I preferred to use that. And then I'm computing the variance of the um, RMSE. So this is the median. What I'm what's about to be on the plot is the median. Um, um, RMSE variance of these different values here. Um, and so this is what the plot that this makes. So you can see we start with high variance. The RMSE that we get, we, we you know, we don't, we, we, it has, it, um, it's jumping up and down a lot. It goes down very steeply and then it starts tapering off. So if, you know, if I look at this plot and I kind of say, oh, am I going to look for an elbow here? I'm going to say there's an elbow maybe around, um, <clears throat> 
you know, maybe around 10, maybe around 12. And so this is where you start to be able to see what kind of trade-offs are involved in any kind of decision that we may make. We can look at this, talk about it with our collaborators and decide what kind of trade-off do we wanna make between how long it takes us to um, estimate the performance of our models and how kind of like how many diminishing returns we get by move bumping up and up in V. So, so we did it. I answered the question. Fantastic. What though? What if you have another question? What if you want to say? So that was variance. What? How? What? How does bias change um, as you change the number of folds? The answer is you should run a simulation. Um, um, spoiler alert: ten is about the right number as well for bias. It gives you kind of a good a good balance in results. What if um, you have more or less data? So I showed you examples with a thousand data points. Um, uh, what if you actually are using working with quite small data or you have something more in the 50,000 or 100,000 or, or very large um, range? Well, you can run a simulation and see how does it change as you change the size of the data set. Spoiler alert, it doesn't really change that much um, uh, like that that relationship with variance specifically. What if you're going to use a different model? Like I use random forest here, but um, you know, there's tons of different options out there that you might use in this sort of classic um, supervised machine machine learning kind of um, environment, or, you know, or you could use deep learning here as well. Um, just run a simulation and you can find, does it change? What is the right answer for you? Spoiler alert, um, this is actually doesn't really depend on what kind of model it is. So you don't, you, you actually will see kind of something kind of flat here. What if you're interested in doing repeated cross validation? This is where I do tenfold, I like make tenfolds. I go back to my initial data, I make tenfolds again. I go back to my data, I make tenfolds again. You could maybe do that like, Re five repeats of 10 fold cross validation that gives you actually 50 folds, but the um, folds are only shuffled within each time that you do it and then you repeat it, you repeat it. Here, actually, you can get to a bit of a different place in terms of bias and variance. So when you ran this simulation, you would you would be able to understand, OK, if I'm willing to invest five more times time, computational time, what can I get out in terms of bias and variance? Oh, you can get out some significant improvements. What if, say, you wanted to use the bootstrap instead of um, cr uh, cr v-fold cross-validation? You can run a simulation that, that compares them. And here, again, um, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of the answer. It turns out that you end up with different trade-offs in terms of bias and variance. Bootstrap tends to be low. Variance, high bias, cross-fold validation tends to be um, low bias, higher variance. So, but you can find this out. You don't have to take my word for it. You can run a simulation. Okay, so so this was sort of the first the first question, and then walking through how you might answer, how you might ask other questions with a similar simulation. Let's walk to a different kind of question. Away from how many folds is too many, and let's ask the question, how many observations do we need? So let's say you are working on some product that is just newly launched, and it is important to you to understand the relationship with two predictors and an outcome that's important to your business. Business. Um, you, though, suspect or, may, or maybe know that there is an interaction between those two predictors, like the value of one predictor changes the relationship between the other predictor and the outcome. This is called an interaction in, um, in statistics, and you don't know what the effect size is. Um, let's say it come for this new product that you're like starting to roll out, people are starting to use it. It is important to your business to know um, what is the effect size um, of this. And so you are going to run an experiment and you're gonna collect data and, be, and build a model and understand this. You know, a lot of you are probably hearing this and you're saying, ah, yes, I A-B test, um, effect size calculator. This is a, this is a, um, this is a power calculation. If I'm asking the question, how many observations do I need in order to be able to do something? Um, though all those A-B test calculators that are out there, though, they, they typically only work for the most straightforward case, um, like, a, like you're going to do a t-test at the end. If what you want to do is some more complex kind of model and you need to know how many things you have to have to start with, then to be able to get the answer that to be able to find out the answer that you're looking for. What you need to do there is a simulation. Um, you might call it a power simulation. So let's walk through real, I'm just gonna, you know, don't worry too much about the details here. What do notice um, though that I'm writing a function from scratch now to generate the data. So I'm basically, um, what I'm doing here is I'm making my assumptions concrete in the way that I did, I said at the beginning, I say, okay, I've got two, um, 
predictors that are um, random normal. And then um, I am going to make explicit my assumption about the relationships between the predictors that I have and the outcomes and how they are in fact, how they in fact interact with each other. So this gives us when I call it say with these um, as for a given, you know, a given um, um, uh, assumption about the effect size, I can get out some simulated data. So I take this function, I do something similar to what I, so I can, I, I can run it one time. I get a data, I can, you know, do the kind of model that I might um, to actually use to analyze the data here and um, notice and then I can, and deal with the output. So notice what that here, the interaction term is um, the the effect size that I estimate from the model is not very big and the p value is kind of kind of large compared to the estimates on the linear um, the linear inter the linear coefficients. This is really common with outcome uh, with interaction terms and why it can be, you know, like it is a little more complicated to be able to detect an interaction between two things. Um, uh, I'm using, you know, as a straightforward linear model here, but you could imagine doing this if you're going to take an approach where you're going to use a more complicated model, like a hierarchical model or mixed level model or a fully Bayesian model or something, you can just put that into here. So let's take these little bits and wrap it up into a function. So in the function, what we do here, we make a data set, fit the model, um, get out the output, and then um, and then ask here at the at the bottom. What this is doing is it is saying um, when I say summarize like the significance uh, p value less than 05, What this is saying is how often do I detect. Um, the the how often am I able to detect the interaction term? I'm so able to measure it. And so if I were to if I run this a hundred times for an effect size of 0.1, or I, and and a uh, um, a a sample size of 100, I detect it 40 percent of the time. And that actually is exactly what power is. That right there is exactly what power is. So I can do it a bunch of times. So, so I am going to. Um, um, try different values of effect size. Maybe people have just started using this um, this feature. And so what I want to do is I want to um, see at what point will I have to, how many people will I have to observe having taken this behavior to be able to detect if this thing that's important to our business has happened or not. And also how big does the, given our assumptions about how big the effect size might be, uh, again, like how, when will I be able to detect it? So let's run this a bunch of times. Let's run it a thousand times all on all these different possible combinations of numbers of samples and effect size. And so then I get I get results. Results are a power. I've done a power simulation here. Let's make a quick visualization. And I get a result that looks like this. So this is symmetric, which is good. Um, we would be really surprised if um, the the um, the interaction term going one way, we couldn't expect, we couldn't, you know, detect it if it went the other way too. So it's symmetric, which is very good. What's on the x axis is the effect size. How big of an interaction is there? Um, when, like, what, how much difference does the value of one predictor make on the relationship between the other predictor and the outcome? So how big is the effect size? On the y axis is the power. So a typical statistical cutoff is 80%, meaning 80% um, of the time I would um, detect a real effect. And so if we say, okay, is it important to our business if the effect size is less than say 0, absolute value of 0.05? If the answer is no, then then great. You know, we don't have to worry about there. But let's say we decide for our business actually if the effect size has an absolute value of greater than 0 0.05, then we can come to these lines and we can look and say, okay, I'm gonna need, you know, 700, 900, 1,000 um, uh, samples to be able to tell you that. So this is an example of a, how to answer um, a, a question using simulation. We can make our, con our assumptions concrete and then are able to make a better decision than we would otherwise. All right, in my last bit of time, I wanna talk about one other kind of question you can um, answer with simulation. And that is, so first we had how many folds are too many? 
Um, we had, we had um, how many observations do I need? And now how important is this relationship? The, um, the t code that I've shown you so far is all just like really basic tidy versus tidy models code that you could do in any, you know, in any language that you use, you could write it out. Um, but here, I'm, this is a package that's a little bit more special. It's really unique um, idea. It's called the Nullabore package, and it is for graphical inference. So, so what this means is doing statistical inference visually. So uh, let's simulate one more data set. So it also, like before, is going to have two predictors and an outcome. But the relationship now here is um, the, the predictor one is linear. It's linear, uh, linearly related to the outcome. Predictor two is related uh, with the log. So it does not, so the, the rate of it changing is very different, right? I feel like in many situations of interest, you end up with these log, with these power law relationships, right? Like with these, um, like power laws are everywhere around us all the time, right? And so this, this is actually a fairly realistic thing that happen. And so um, often there are these relationships that are power law relationships, and it can sometimes be hard to communicate to stakeholders, especially um, less technical stakeholders, what what it really means when there is a power law and something like and what does that mean in terms of our leverage of how easy it is to change so let's just make some quick visualizations here's the linear one predictor one is on the x-axis the outcome is on the x-axis we can see that sort of linear change there here's predictor two it looks quite different right there's the absolute value there so that's what we have we kind of see it going up in these different ways but it, at these values it's you know, it's like uh, that. That one's that one's a little more like a blob, right? A little bit more like a blob. So what the nullabore package lets you do is it lets you make what's called a lineup. So um, this is like the metaphor here is like you've been taken to the police station to go look at a lineup of possible criminals, and can you identify the one that you? Um, that you saw before like is it possible for you to end identify the one that you saw before so the kind of lineup that i'm going to use now is it is a, a permutation under the null um hypothesis so basically what the kind of graphical inference we're doing is um given the null hypothesis is the um um how how unlikely is the um the effect that we're seeing so yes i'm talking about p-values p-values done um via visualization so we're doing the simulation right like we've talked about before and then we're gonna do um, a visual get a visual p-value so let's look at this and everyone look at it and then i'll drop a question so if you all i'm putting this in the ask the speakers um slack channel so if you want to go in there and maybe thread it or something um which of these do you think is the um the real relationship not the not the permuted one that was simulated but the real one somebody go in and put in there what they think it is i'll just wait for at least one person to go in Yes. Okay. I think this one's pretty easy to find. Um, 14 is the real one. 14 is the one that is the real relationship and the rest of them have gotten, um, are, are random, are just random. So if we did this over and over and over, um, with a lot of people, I actually can compute a P value with that because there's 20 here, you know, like we can do this, all this kind of thing. Let's now look at the next one. So this is the second um, predictor. This is the second um, predictor here. Let's permute it and let's see um, what we can, let's see whether we can see it or not. So here is the second one. So let me just put this in here. So which one in the lineup here do you think is the real one that um, versus the permuted random one? take a look i i think this one's harder um i think this one is harder um but still possible i think this one is harder but still possible um <clears throat> Uh, and if I actually bump the, the standard deviation up a little bit, you would actually not be able to see it at all. Like literally there would be no way to be able to, to be able to tell this, but yes, 
Yes, that's right. So this one is still two, which means it is actually probably still statistically significant. And we can like that, that it is different from random and we are able to see it. So what this, this is an example of a way to use simulation with relationships that you may have in your real data to be able to understand how important they are, be able to, and in a way that is very um, accessible to, to, um, you know, people that you may need to communicate with us about this. It's a really helpful exercise. So like the rest of them, um, uh, what that shows us is how some simulation can be this really powerful tool to help us, you know, do these things. We, we are able to, um, uh, get out of our heads and our collaborators' heads and co into code, you know, the assumptions that we have, where we be able to talk about trade-offs, see what the trade-offs really are, um, and, and ultimately make better decisions. So we're, I think almost all of us here are like, like data folks, right? And usually we try to use data to make decisions. So I think, um, again, I think there's almost more, nothing more like, like in the norm conf ethos than to say like, oh, I don't have any data to make this decision i will just i will just make some up I and mean, i think it's a sign of health and a sign of um using a tool that's available to us to be to be able to do that to be able to generate data that um, um helps us understand about trade-offs and make things concrete so with that i will um say thank you very much and see if we have any questions we want to chat about